In June of 1969 in New York, there was a bar called the Stonewall Inn. And this bar had actually been recently taken over by the mafia. Three members of the mafia owned this bar. And they had turned it into a gay bar. They saw this, the market potential of the first gay bar in New York, or the first fairly openly gay bar in New York. These members of the mafia struck a bit of a sweetheart deal with the police. They would pay them off every once in a while in exchange for tips. The police, some of them who were being paid off, would tip off the owners of the bar when there were raids coming. See, it was not legal to be a homosexual in those days, and it was certainly not permitted to gather in a gay bar in that way in 1969. But one night there was a raid that was not announced. The people didn't have a chance to clear out as they normally would when they were being warned of such a raid. This is in the wee hours of the morning. We can imagine the kind of state that people were in in the wee hours of the morning in a bar. But the brutality that followed is one that would set the course of history in a new direction. See, for days, people would march because of the brutality that others had experienced when they squeezed people out of that bar and onto the streets. Things were actually relatively calm until one woman was manhandled into the back of a cruiser and on her way into the cruiser, she looked around at the crowd that had gathered again at 2 or 3 a.m. and said, why are you just standing there? And so the people marched. For days they marched and they rioted to protest against the kind of force that was happening and to assert the right of LGBTQ people, then known as homosexuals, gays, lesbians, queer folk, this turned into the pride parade of today. Today it's generally a celebration for a lot of people. We celebrate the gains that we've made, and this is good. But it's also got its roots in, these, in this protest, this march. And while, it has, and while LGBTQ people have been put at the forefront of these parades, marches, rallies, it's important to remember a few people instrumental in the initial demonstration in the aftermath of the Stonewall Inn raids, because these were people of color. You might have heard the name Martha P. Johnson. She's a, she identified as a drag queen in those days, African-American. Apparently she's one who climbed a telephone or a, a street light and dropped a brick on a police cruiser. I don't want to support that kind of action. It doesn't get us anywhere, but we can get a sense of the rage that she might have experienced seeing once again another police raid on her identity, on her way of living out the way that God had created her, of her expression of being a good part of God's creation. And so this month is Pride Month, and there will be demonstrations and marches. And it's important to remember, as we see this, that when there are multiple identities intertwined, what we call intersectionality, some people will take on even more vulnerability than otherwise. Black people in America, in the United States, and in Canada are saying that they're not safe. Queer folk are saying they're not safe. Imagine if you're black and you're queer, how safe are you feeling these days? The doctrine of the Trinity underlies the United Church of Canada, we have said. We've decided that if one can't proclaim faith in the Trinity, then one does not belong, at least as clergy, in the United Church of Canada. But what the heck does this Trinity doctrine even mean? We're saying that this is the core of our faith, and yet so many find it difficult to articulate. It's easy to say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
creator, sustainer, redeemer, all these different ways of expressing the Trinity are lovely. What it boils down to for me is that God is inherently a relational being. This relationship between a father and a son, of a creator and a begotten, that's what God is. It also tells me that God is an intersectional person. God, God's self, carries multiple identities, and this is good. This is very good. Jesus himself, we say, Jesus, were you a human? Are you God? What are you? How do we categorize you, Jesus? Which is what so many attempt to do, especially when it comes to gender, trans people. What exactly are you? Are you male or are you female? Jesus responds by saying, both and. Take these neat categories that you have and blend them together because I am both and. Jesus is both God and human. When God created humanity, God didn't create male and female separately. God created all of us, maybe, male and female in one. In fact, some species are both male and female with the way that they reproduce. All of us, I believe, carry some kind of male and female in one, and we hear this in the writings of Genesis. God created us all as beautiful beings. God looks at you and sees God's self, God's image projected in you, and sees beauty and says, this is good. God says, you are good. God says to our adversaries, you are good. I find this hard to believe. I don't know about you, but when the President of the United States holds up a Bible with a somewhat militant expression in the aftermath of having used excessive force to clear protesters out of a police square for the purpose of a photo op, I say, how does God look upon that and say this is beautiful? How does God see God's self in those who seek to harm others or even kill others? As we say in my household these days, it's mind-boggling. How can God possibly declare that those who seek to hurt or kill others are good? This is a challenge for us to hear. As we're trying to figure out how to make sense of the world when the United States may be well on the brink of some kind of heavily armed conflict internally again, when there are demonstrators around the world seeking to assert their identities and seeking to remind all of us that yes, God loves them too, people with multiple identities making them vulnerable, how do we do? How do we respond? What do we do? In my studying this week, my discernment this week, I've landed on five things for us to take away today. It's a lot to remember, I know. I couldn't remember them, so I had to write them down. So I'll post these for us to find later if you're interested. The first thing for us to do is to study and learn as much as we possibly can. What is going on? What actually is happening? Is racism as bad in Canada as people say it is? I picked up a copy of The Skin We're In by Desmond Cole, someone who has been in my living room, by the way. And I've been reading it this week. And I'll tell you what, a lot of the stories, when I'm reading them, I say to myself, that can't be. How is it possible? Desmond Cole is two years younger than I am. He's been stopped 50 times at the time of writing this book, 50 times, and asked for his ID. I've been stopped three times, and it's because I was speeding, or actually, I guess more if I consider going into bars also. But he's been stopped actively 50 times because he has black skin. I encourage all of you to pick up this book. Read it, share it, 
Support Desmond and others. Another one, So You Want to Talk About Race by Ijioma Aluo. I encourage you, pick this up and read it. It answers all of the questions that might be on your hearts right now. What the heck is going on? She answers a lot of those. More than just studying and learning though, instead of just learning something new every day, I wonder if I can challenge you to change your mind about something, one thing every day. And that means maybe digging deep enough and far enough to understand another's perspective to change your mind about something every day. I've had my, my mind changed many times this past week in reading these books. Study and learn and change your mind every day and believe the stories. That's the first one. The second one is to be specific with your words and with your language. You've heard the phrase, Black Lives Matter. I've used this phrase today. Some people say, why can't we just enlarge the scope of that? And they say, why don't we say all lives matter? To which I say, yes, of course, all lives matter. But the analogy is this. Your house is on fire, and so you call the fire department. You give them your address. You hear the sirens. You've left your house. And they stop at the end of your block. And you run over to the fire, to the, for the fire engine standing at, sitting at the edge of your block. You say, my house is just down there. It's the one on fire. It's number 312. Like, oh, I know. Yeah, we, we got that information. But you see, all houses matter. So we're going to check on all these houses first to make sure there isn't a fire. And then we'll get to your house in time. There is a house on fire right now, black people are telling us, and it's important to be specific with where that fire is happening, and it is in black lives right now. It's also happening in indigenous lives. I believe it's okay to say indigenous lives matter. That is true. But we have to name where the pain is, to name where the injustice is occurring. We can't just say all, people, uh, all people's lives matter, even though it's true, we need to be specific with it. So let's be specific with our words. I believe we need to disarm the police. I haven't landed on whether this means completely disarming the police, but I know that in the UK, the police that are on patrol do not carry firearms. They carry batons, they carry mace, I believe, and pepper spray. In the United States, the police are so armed that I can't tell the difference between a military force and a police force, euphemistically dubbed a police service, anymore. I believe that if we are going to protect lives, we need to disarm the police. Some are calling for us to defund the police, and I'm not actually convinced by this one yet. Maybe I'll get there. But the police actually need more funding. We probably need police to be on foot more, spending more time with the communities. Less time armed, more time in conversation. That might actually cost a bit more money, but I do believe we need to disarm the police. We need to focus on a restorative justice instead of a punitive justice. Our prisons are filled with indigenous bodies and black bodies disproportionate to the population and disproportionate in my study anyway to the rate of crime. What happens in prisons is these racial divides grow. Gang life grows in prisons. We need to keep people out of prisons. We need to focus on a justice that can restore people, that can bring life back to communities. My challenge to you, since I won't be with you after the end of the month, my challenge to you is take our affirming statement and add the word race to it. So that all, regardless of sexual orientation and gender identity and race can participate fully in the life and leadership of this church community. And it's as simple as taking a pen and adding in race or having a motion of the board or a congregational motion, and it sounds easy to do, right? But recall that when we wanted to add language about sexual orientation and gender identity, it sounded easy, but it was actually fairly difficult. It was a two-year process to reach that consensus that, yes, now we can say that we are committed to this. 
we need to dig deep into the notions of race and what our church community can do about it. And once we've considered that, then we can say, yes, we affirm this. The language is cheap, but the actions are costly or should be. It should take something of us to dig deep within ourselves, make ourselves vulnerable, and then say, yes, we affirm this right. That's five, to study and learn, to be specific with our words, say the words, black lives matter, disarm the police, focus on restorative justice, add race to our affirming statement. And here's a bonus one. Amidst all of this chaos and confusion and uncertainty, we've got to celebrate. We've got to celebrate. We've got to celebrate. It's not called lament marches. They're called pride marches. We have come a long way in this country and elsewhere. We are on the right track. We have got to celebrate. While the Indian Act might still segregate people based on race, there are no other laws that legally designate a segregation by race in Canada. We need to celebrate this. We need to celebrate the gains that are made in workplaces when they have good, solid diversity policies. We need to celebrate that homosexuality is not illegal anymore in Canada. We need to celebrate that this church has said, yes, yes, we want you to be in its, this midst, our midst. We want you to know God's love too. And I believe this is a genuine statement this church congregation has made. I want you to celebrate that. So would you, as you're able, stand up? <laughs> Let's stand up. Let's at least give a round of applause for the gains that we've made. Can we give a round of applause for asserting that God's love is for all people? What else should we applaud today? What else are we celebrating? The sunshine. The sunshine, sure, let's celebrate the sunshine. <laughs> And the rain, gotta have the rain. Oh, oh yeah, I need to unmute, yes. Okay, if you're joining us from a distance, what are we celebrating today? What else are we celebrating? Sure. Get together, woo. Okay, they got it. Family. Family. The voice of children. <laughs> All right. And wings. Say it again. No. Our expanding gardens. Our expanding gardens. <laughs> and friends. Friends. We have the freedom to protest. Say it again. Freedom to protest. The freedom to protest. Yes, the freedom to protest. <laughs> Keeping what? COVID at bay. Yes, that's right. Keeping COVID at bay. <laughs> Anything, Sarah? I, I missed that. <laughs> We're just celebrating. What are we celebrating right now? Life. <laughs> What's that? I'm happy to be together. You see, even though we're apart, we are actually all one. This doctrine of the Trinity shows that there is complexity, that we can all be together. Our multiple identities are all beloved by God who looks upon us and says, this is good. You are good. 
Very good. Keep it up. We'll create the world that we need. We are creating it. There are bumps along the way, but God is with us at every step. Guiding us, holding our hands. Redeeming us. Reconciling us. God makes us all one.